I'll be the light to guide you. Find out what we're made of when we are called to help our friends in need. Hi, my name is Nicole and I'm a senior. I am thrilled to introduce Maria Shriver, an award-winning journalist, founder of Shriver Media, Architects of Change Live, The Shriver Report, A Woman's Nation, The Woman's Alzheimer's Challenge, former First Lady of California, and an activist for social change and equality. Her California Women's Conference was the inspiration for our Young Women's Conference, and she has served as our honorary chair since its inception in 2012. I am incredibly inspired by her accomplishments and everything she has done to help women across the globe. In the Shriver Report, one of her most prominent social justice projects, she explores changes in modern American culture that significantly affect women. The 2014 edition, A Woman's Nation Pushes Back from the Brink, revealed that the face of poverty in the United States is that of a woman and sparked a national conversation. To use her phrase, she is an architect of change in her own right. Today, Ms. Shriver will be interviewing Cindy Crawford, one of the most well-known supermodels in the world. She has worked with several of the biggest names in the industry, posed for many well-known fashion magazines, and walked the runway for a variety of designers. In addition to modeling, she's also known for her inherent business savvy and has developed her own furniture and skincare lines. She's an active philanthropist and environmentalist. She recently published a New York Times best-selling book entitled Becoming Sydney. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Shriver and Ms. Crawford. Hi, hi, can everybody hear us? Have you been having a great day? Great, great. Well, thank you for welcoming us, and I want to thank my friend Cindy Crawford, who you all know, I'm sure, for joining us today. Uh, you heard a little bit about the introduction. We talk about architects of change, and I want to say that this woman sitting here is an architect of change. You heard that she's an entrepreneur, which is a businesswoman. She's a wife, she's a mother, she's a model, and she's somebody who has navigated uh, several decades in the public eye. So I want to welcome her. Thank you. And thank her for coming to share some of her wisdom, which I hope will be helpful to all the young women and their parents who might be here today. And we're gonna start by, since we just listened to a panel about friends, uh, Cindy and I were talking in the back about girls and how women navigate friendship and the called mean girl um, thing that we hear so much about. And I wanted to ask you, did you ever have uh, a mean girl experience in high school? And if you did, how'd you navigate that? Wouldn't it be nice if I said no? <laughs> and sadly, that's not true, of course. Um, and I think, Sharing those bad experiences, like I think it helps other women and young women realize like they're not the only ones. And uh, when I was, I think 16 years old, and I had never even thought about being a model yet. I didn't even know that that was like a job that I could somehow do. I wouldn't right. have known how to get from A to B. Um, I got a call. I lived in a small town in Illinois, and I got a call from, the, the lo this local clothing store, and they said that they would like me to come in because uh, they would wanted me to model for their store. And I remember putting my hair in hot curlers and my Calvin Klein jeans or whatever, it was the jean of the moment, and going down to this little store, and I walked in and I said, oh, hi, I'm Cindy, I'm here for the modeling job, and, and the, they were like, we don't know what you're talking about. And I said, no, you guys called me, and I'm here for the modeling job, and they said, we're sorry, it wasn't us. And I walked out of the store and I saw these two girls from my high school standing on the corner laughing because they knew that they what that I had just, you know, been embarrassed. And it was just like my heart sank. But cut to my 10-year high school reunion. <laughs> And I'd been on the cover of Vogue, and I had my MTV crew there with me. And I guess I was like, I was like, well, I guess it worked out after all, girls. Karma, uh, karma. Exactly. So, anyway, just remember, sometimes it works out that way. That's right. And don't let something like that 
defeat you. Yeah. I think that's a really important experience because you could have said, you could have gone off and cried and said, I'm never going to try that right. again because so many people get rejected and dejected and then they can't go on. What has kept you kind of in the game and pushing yourself forward and not getting discouraged? Gosh, I think a lot of that is just the way that I was raised and, um, you know, I do talk about, and I talk about it in my book a lot, is that I don't, modeling is what I do. It's not who I am. So it's my job. And I worked hard at school, and I worked hard when I worked in a clothing store folding shirts. I worked hard babysitting. So to me, I work hard as a model. And part of working hard is also paying attention. Because then you're, you're, you're absorbing, you're learning. Um, and, you know, I was surrounded by the most incredible photographers and makeup artists and advertising people. And if you hang out with really talented people, you, it does rub off on you. And you can, you can actually learn so much. So I feel like I got, I was able to, even though I dropped out of college because my modeling career took off, I was able in a way to get an education through my work by paying attention. So I think what she... What you just mentioned, which I think is really important, you worked in a store, mm -hmm. you folded shirts, you babysat. A lot of young people that I talk to say, like, I don't have time for that. I need to be Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. um, what did you learn from working in those jobs that helped you when you got to the top? Well, I also, even modeling, my first modeling job, well, one of them was modeling belts where my head wasn't in it and my, from, I was only in it from here to here. Um, and those jobs make you appreciate the good jobs. <laughs> uh, but also, I mean, I, al I had to work. I always had to make my own money. So starting out babysitting, working in cornfields, I think um, my takeaway from that was to not be afraid of hard work and the satisfaction of making your own money. You know, like getting that first paycheck. And it was minimum wage. I was detasseling corn. It was really hot and hard work. Um, I was doing it with a, a lot of my friends, so even though it was horrible, it wasn't horrible. Mm -hmm. um, but to have that, and I'm, we're jumping around a little bit, but my parents were uh, divorced, and I saw my mom be financially dependent on my father after the divorce, and sometimes, sadly, uh, my dad would use money as a way to kind of control my mother, and I remember thinking, that's not going to be me. You know, I don't want, I want to be able to, I don't want to be with a guy because I have to be with him. I want to be with a guy because I choose to be with him. That's empowering. Now, I was telling you there are uh, young people here from more than 100 different schools, yeah, different so economic great. backgrounds, different types of families, because we hear so many things about different types of families. And you just mentioned that your parents were divorced. You also lost your brother. Mm -hmm. um, so as I always say, nobody gets a free ride. Everybody right. has something that they have to deal with. And how did those tragedies, those difficulties shape you? And did anything good come from them for you? Um, well, yeah, so the, I had a pretty, very nice Midwestern small town upbringing, um, cousins and grandmas and grandpas, and, you know, we didn't ha have, we hardly had any money, but it was, it was we, we were happy, and then my brother um, was two years old, and he got diagnosed with leukemia, and he passed away two years later, and I was 10 years old when he died, um, old enough to know what was going on, and old enough to watch how devastating that was for my parents. Um, and I guess it's hard to say that something good came out of that, but in a way, it, it's how you, um, you know, part of grieving. Like I saw how my mother chose to grieve was get involved in leukemia charities, right. raise money. Um, and I saw that even though we didn't hardly have any money, we could have a dance marathon and we raised two hundred dollars and that seemed like a ton of money and that empo it felt empowering it, it it showed me like um that you you know it's it, it's bigger than just you like if you join forces with people to raise money or to do something that you can do more than just you yourself can do and i also think even though it's tragic when you lose someone at a young age First of all, you don't take life for granted, because mm -hmm. I think a lot of, especially high schoolers, and believe it or not, Maria and I were there once, too. <laughs> not um, that long ago. <laughs> that you think 
that you're immortal and like you have, and then you know, so much time and nothing bad can happen. And and when something does bad does happen, it reminds you like don't take it for granted, don't take any of it for granted, and work hard and appreciate the days that you do have and the opportunities that you do have. It's like it it made me I think a little more focused. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that you just said is really important, that there's always something you can do, and you don't have to be in college or out of college to make an impact. So starting a little event that raises $200 mm -hmm. is empowering and goes a long way. So I'm always a big believer in that and, and never being afraid of doing something if you see a problem that you can actually do something no matter what your age. Right. And I think that that's such an important uh, lesson. Since so many of the young uh, women are here, I remember in your book or an interview I read that you said, looking back, if you could have talked to your high school self, you would have told her to be less fearless or to be more fearless. Mm -hmm. And what would you say to these young people about uh, what would have happened differently for you had you been more fearless? And what advice would you give them if they feel like, oh, I don't want to model, I don't want to uh, think I can start a business, I don't think I can make an impact? Well, I, so I grew up in a really small town, very unsophisticated, um, and, and I all of a sudden was in New York and with, you know, these designers and everyone's so, everyone seems so sophisticated and fabulous and you'd be sitting at these dinners and I remember once Nora Ephron saying to me like, who are you? You know, like, and she wasn't asking my name. She was basically saying, like, why should I care about you, right? right. And I was like, I'm just a girl. Right? And that's, all, that's what I said. I said, I'm just a girl. And then I realized, really, everyone at the table, they're all just a girl. We, we all are insecure. We all have that. And so sometimes we think everyone else is so together and so confident because that's the face that we all put on for the world. Um, but we all, that's, that's the one thing that unites us as humans, or one of the things, is just that we all have vulnerabilities. And that's a beautiful thing as well. Like, if you didn't have any chinks in your armor, you'd be mm -hmm. impenetrable, right? And right. that means, like, no one can, you won't let anyone in either. So just recognizing it, that you're not the only one at the dinner table who maybe it doesn't, isn't sure what that play is or what that word means or, or what that fork is for exactly <laughs> like there's a every single person there has a version of that and to not let that stop you and so there were there were things that I didn't do opportunities that I had that I was like oh I'm not gonna I don't know what to wear or what am I gonna say and those are my those are the regrets I don't have a lot of regrets but those things where I let my fear keep me from doing it those are the regret, regrets I have now. We were talking in the back because Cindy is an entrepreneur. She has her own beauty line and furniture. And you were saying that it was really hard for you to begin to think of yourself as a businesswoman mm -hmm. because you kept thinking some guy is going to come along yeah. and show me what to do. How did you change that mindset? Why did you think you needed a guy to help you with your business? Well, you look, I started out as a model and you have like an agent. and. And in the beginning, I mean, models are not always treated like they have an IQ. Um, and you, I always, fortunately, I was valedictorian, so I knew I was smart. <laughs> um, so I didn't let that rub off on me. But, and so when people treated me like I was dumb, it, to me it was like saying more about them than about me. That's a really important life lesson you just heard here. <laughs> That's a really important life lesson. When someone treats you some way, it says more about them than it does about you. Okay. Yes, as Lindy would say, our friend, <laughs> they're reporting on themselves. Very good. That's um, right. Projecting. So, so, but in business, I, I didn't have any business experience. And as a model, my, my agent would just say, you know, so-and-so wants to book you, and they would negotiate the rate, and I would, you know, they would send me the check. It was great. But as time started going on and I started getting more involved and I had a show on MTV and I did an exercise video and I wanted to do my own things and I kept wanting, and I told you, I kept wanting a business daddy. I'm like, oh, I just want a business daddy, like this guy that was going to swoop in and he was going to make my life perfect and he was going to tell me, yes, say yes to this, no, say no to this. And I kept trying to manifest business daddy. 
And then I realized <laughs> I had to be my own business daddy. And um, I still listen to other people. Mm -hmm. And I want, I, I try to surround myself with smart people who know what they're doing. But in the end, and here's, and you guys will all understand this because you guys are a different generation, but like, I am, I might not be an expert on much, but I'm the world's expert on Cindy Crawford. No one knows more about Cindy Crawford than Cindy Crawford. And sometimes it's tempting to give your power away to people who you think are smarter or know more, but you know more what's right for you than anybody. And so you gotta be your own business daddy. And your own life, Daddy, I guess, in a way. <laughs> there, another great life, life lesson there. You are your own expert, mm -hmm. and you have an expertise, which is also really important, I think, to, to, uh, for everybody who wants to be an entrepreneur today. You were saying in a minute ago that you wanted to be with a man because you wanted to be, mm -hmm. not because you were financially dependent. So a lot of young men are growing up in an era where they're dealing with really empowered women, mm -hmm. women who might be their bosses. They might be ending up in relationships or marriages where the woman earns more than them mm -hmm. or is more famous than them. And you have, uh, I know your husband, Randy, and they have a really great relationship. What would you say to young women if they find themselves in a relationship where they might be earning more than the man or what would you say also, there are some men here, and we're going to be having a day on masculinity this week, about navigating power in a relationship. I mean, it's, it's definitely, it can be challenging, um, but it's, it's kind of like if you're a tall girl, and you're with a guy, and they don't want you to wear heels because it makes you taller than them, probably not the right guy. <laughs> like, if you feel good in the heels, like you want a guy that wants you to feel good, right? So if, right. if your high heels make you taller... And, and I think it goes the same with the paycheck, in a way. It's like, um, you know, fortunately, my husband, he has enough self-esteem, self-confidence. He's very successful in his own right. I mean, I happen to have a crazy job that pays like, like I'm, I'm like an athlete, right? It like gets paid like some, a crazy amount of money that doesn't necessarily make sense, but I'm not turning it down. Um, <laughs> So, you know, it would be, if, it would set the bar very high if I only was going to go out with guys who made more money than me. Um, but the guy that's going to be with a woman who has her own career, her own um, way of supporting herself, it, takes, it does take a strong guy. But don't we want to be with strong guys? Um, yeah. So we shouldn't have to work too hard to make them feel okay about us making more money than them. Um, but at the same time, I do think... There are times, even in my own marriage, that, look, men really, I love this, um, that men need to do good to feel good, and women need to feel good to do good. And I think that's true. So, like, for men, they, they want to be respected. They, they, you know, and it doesn't have to be about, like, overly complimenting them or whatever, but there is... Um, there, there's a, full, you know, you, you a communication. Were, yeah, and it's like, it's okay. Like, I mean, if you don't want a guy to open the door for you, then I guess that's okay. But like, I personally like when a guy opens the door for me. But if they don't want to, I certainly can open my own door. <laughs> um, but you know, so it's, it's kind of like each person has to define that for themselves. And in within your relationship, um, that mutual respect and friendship, and that's the other. I mean totally off topic, but it's about if this person, if you think the person would be your friend, even if you weren't going out with them, that's, that should be the minimum. Like you have to know that you guys would be friends even if you weren't going out. Great piece of advice. Friends, someone who respects you yeah. and doesn't mind if you wear heels. That's uh -huh. right. And you also have to be okay with if you wear heels, he's shorter and that's okay too. Yeah. That's also really important. Before, we're going to let some people ask a couple questions, but I just wanted to say there's so much emphasis on beauty in today's culture, and so many young women that I speak to feel so much stress and anxiety trying to keep up with the clothes, the makeup, the weight, the hair. What advice do you have for young women who are trying to or comparing themselves to the supermodels that they see on TV, in videos, on Instagram? Right. Snapchat, Facebook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All those places that we don't even know about. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, it's, 
I do talk often, and when I was a kid, I got teased about having a beauty mark by starting with my sisters who called it an ugly mark. Um, in high school, like I remember freshman year, first day, like the whole football team was sitting on the stairs and they're all like, hey, Crawford, you got chocolate on your face, you know? And I was, you know, turned beet red and like ran up the back stairs and never went up the main stairway again the rest of the freshman year. And so, and I asked my mom, could I get my mole removed? And she was smart. She didn't say no. She was like, yeah, if you want to, but you know, you know what that looks like. And you, don't, you might get a scar. You don't know what your scar would look like. And I was like, yeah, OK. And then I went to my very first modeling agency. And they were like, yeah, we like you, but you might want to get your mole removed. And I was like, see, mom, I told you I should remove it. And, but um, I started working anyway. And sometimes they would retouch it off or try to cover it with makeup. Um, but then I did my very first Vogue cover. And Vogue left on my mole. And all of a sudden, if it was like, um, good enough for mole or for Vogue, then it was good enough for everybody. But the thing is, it became my trademark, and that's what—that's the message I think for for all of you guys is that sometimes the very thing that you're most self-conscious about or that makes you different, and 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 I think when you're young, you just want to fit in and you want to have the same jeans as everyone and the same hair as everyone, and um, but sometimes that one thing that makes you different becomes the your trademark or the thing that makes people remember you. So just be kind, treat yourself like you would treat a friend. Like when you, when I see Maria, yeah. I'm like, okay, we went to a Halloween party. Maria normally <laughs> does, you know, she, she's understated and she was Catwoman that night and she looked so hot. And I was like, Maria, you should wear that bodysuit every day. You look amazing in it. Um, but I was so pleased that uh, you said I looked hot. <laughs> I, well, you did. But here's the thing, like that's how we treat our friends. We, and, and they were talking about it on the last panel, we build our friends up. But we treat ourselves not like friends. We see everything that's wrong in ourselves and we see everything that's right in our friends. So if, we could, if you could just look at yourself a little bit through the lens that you see your friends and, and give yourself a little compliment in your head. You don't have to say it all, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying you have to look in the mirror and do affirmations or anything but but that's good though it is good but yeah. I'm just saying like sometimes I know you feel cheesy doing that so it's just but it's just like there look anyone look there must be something you have shiny hair you, like focusing on starting to focus on the positive things um, because what people see in you is your confidence that's all people see you could have the most beautiful person but if they're not confident it doesn't show and you could have someone who's passionate and confident and they're the most beautiful person on the planet. So, um, you know, I think, I think be a little kind to yourselves and then also just get passionate and love what you do and that's what people will see. Great advice. Remember, the thing you think is probably your biggest issue might be your greatest asset. So there's a lot of words of wisdom in here.